Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Again, uh, we are at the uh, 2022 Ashtekar Frontiers of Science Lectures, presented by the Everly College of Science. I I'm still Miguel Mostafa, the Associate Dean for Research and Innovation in the college. And I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Um, this lecture series was founded by Professor Avai Ashtekar, who is the founding director of the Institute of Gravitation and the, uh, for Gravitation and the Cosmos and a member of the National Academy of Science. The series also owes its success to Barbara Kennedy, who presided over the series during the first 25 years, making it one of the most successful science outreach events in Pennsylvania. It brings me to today's lecture, which will be presented by uh, Professor Ashley Villar, Pallar, sorry. I, I, you know, I, anyway, so I introduced her wrong last week. I apologize for that. Uh, professor Villar is an assistant professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics and an Institute of, for Computation and Data Science co-hire. She graduated from MIT with a major in physics, yay, and a minor in mathematics then from Harvard uh, with her PhD in 2020. She uses uh, data-driven methods and machine learning to study eruptions, mergers, and explosions of stars, and is especially interested in utilizing multiband light curves to understand the underlying physics of optical transients. Ashley, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm gonna take a second just to... Um get all my screens in order. As soon as we do that, I'm all set. One last button. Okay, I think you should be able to see my full screen. Um, thank you so much for hosting me this morning and for joining us over Zoom. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about the origins of, I say heavy elements, but really in some ways, all of the elements that we know about in the cosmos. Um, and I'll tell you, it'll really be a little bit of a whirlwind tour of the physics we're interested in, but also really the methodology we're using, which relies on um, artificial intelligence or specifically machine learning techniques to deal with large amounts of data that we get from the sky. And I always like to start by explaining that I study something called transient phenomenon or time domain astrophysics. And this really refers to things that are changing very actively on human time scales in our night sky. So I think when we look up sometimes, um, well, pretty reasonably, we think that we're looking at this never changing history of our universe that even our ancestors have been looking at essentially the same picture. And this is largely true. Um, if something evolves on million year time scales in the cosmos, astronomers may say, oh, that's really young um, because the age of our universe is in the billions of years. But what I study are things that are happening on days, weeks, or year time scales, things that we actively have to look at. And it's really truly the active evolution of our cosmos. That is time domain astrophysics. And in particular, what I'm really interested in, what we'll talk a lot about today, are the different ways that stars um, end their life. So for example, I'm showing you, uh, this is not real, just a artistic simulation of um, a core collapse supernova, which we'll go through in detail. So they're really these catastrophic events that highlight a number of interesting uh, physics and astrophysics. So for example, Supernovae um, really are one of the only types of labs, a cosmic lab, that can probe a very unique high energy physics. So things like launching a, a jet um, that we can see from millions of light years away. They also highlight in the, uh, for again, supernovae, so the death of stars, they highlight the final kind of years, it's older age. Um, and if the star was doing something kind of funky at the end, so for example, I'm showing you this really beautiful real image um, of Ada Carr from HST, where we can see these large kind of asymmetric um, lobes coming off. And that's actually it, uh, erupting or burping off kind of its outer layers just before it's signaling that it's, it's almost time to die. We're almost time to die. 
for astronomers could mean anything from tomorrow to a few thousand years from now. It's very soon in astronomical times, but who's to say it will happen in our lifetime? And kind of in one of the most newest players on the block that I'll, I'll mention in this talk is they also teach us about um, other exotic and interesting physics. So for example, general relativity through uh, co-observations with gravitational waves and light sources that we see from our telescopes. And we'll talk about that in detail. So there's really a plethora of fun science to learn about, but the one that I'm really excited about today is understanding where the uh, where this comes from. This is the periodic table of elements, where it's just a way that we go about organizing um, the elements that we know of, either that are formed naturally in the cosmos or that we formed um, within the lab, and they might be even unstable. Uh, and what I want to show you is, what if we ask the question, where do these actually come from? And I don't mean, um, where is gold being mined on Earth? I mean things like, how did helium get created in our universe? And we can actually color code this whole table by those cosmic origins. So here I'm just showing you, uh, you can see the top few, which are being formed uh, very early in our universe's history. Really, it's its first day alive in the cosmos. So the Big Bang, the origin of our universe, really only led to essentially two elements, hydrogen and helium. We can get a little bit further by some uh, high energy particles kind of hitting our atmosphere and they, they can go a little bit more to, to fuse together things like hydrogen and make the heavier elements, but that's it. Um, this is all that early physics like the Big Bang makes. So where is everything else? Where does it come from? Obviously I've been hinting at supernovae, so that's probably a clue. Um, I wanna tell you that I, I, as I said, I study the death of stars, which implies that stars in a sense live and die, which means that they originate as clouds which collapse. They begin to undergo processes we'll discuss. They continue those processes for a long time until eventually something happens and they explosively, um, if they're heavy enough, they explosively die as something we call supernova that we can see with our own telescopes. So what is this process that they're spending their life doing? Um, so this is uh, just a cartoon graphic that's representing that stars are actually um, spending the majority of their life burning through uh, or fusing different elements. So we can, you know, this is very simplified, but we can think about, you know, built, putting together Lego blocks of elements. We, we smush two hydrogen atoms together and we make a helium atom, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the stars do this throughout their life. We call it burning, but by that we mean uh, nucleosynthesis, putting these elements together to make heavier and heavier elements. And this process keeps happening until something special will occur. So in particular, um, it's very efficient to smush together two hydrogen atoms to make a heavier helium uh, atom. And by that, I mean, pretend we're making a fire or something and I have some sticks and I wanna make a fire. Maybe I'm pretty good at it. I, I'm personally not good at it, but, um, and it takes me, I don't know, a minute or something to get those sticks burning and I have some fuel. And then I have a fire burning all night it keeps me warm all night. So that tiny bit of energy that I had to use to make the fire was definitely worth it because now I can be kind of happy and enjoying my night at a campsite. So that's what happens with hydrogen. Then we start to burn slightly heavier elements like carbon, or sorry, we start to fuse slightly heavier elements like carbon. We're playing the same game. We're making a, a fire with our sticks, but now I'm, I'm not so good. Maybe the sticks are a little, um, wet. And so it takes me an hour, but okay, I still get a few hours of the fire itself. It's still worth it. This is exactly what happens when we're burning these elements. Um, and this is um, maybe a slightly confusing plot, but 
all I'm showing is essentially um, as a function of atomic number, how much fire time do I get versus how long it took me to make it? So how much energy did I have to spend versus how much energy I got back? And it turns out that I guess less and less energy back uh, as I go higher and higher up elements. And that's called an exothermic reaction where I have to spend uh, less energy than the amount of energy I get out. Unfortunately, when I get to iron, I take five hours to start my fire and then I get four hours and 59 minutes out of it. It costs more energy than I actually get from it. That's called an endothermic reaction. This is very bad for a star. Um, it's, it's not just like I'm, I'm cold from the fire. Inside the star, there are two forces that are constantly at war. The star is uh, it's a heavy thing and it's being pulled together by gravity. It wants to collapse in on itself. Uh, and then the burning of these elements is exerting an opposite force as a pressure. I'm getting energy out and that energy is pushing against the gravity. Unfortunately, when I start to eat up my energy, and I don't get enough out, gravity wins. And the star itself is going to collapse until it reaches a, a specific density, at which point it bounces back outwards, the material of that star, and we see it as a supernova, as shown in this very scientific diagram. Um, and within this process, the supernova uh, has been spending its whole life working hard, making these heavy elements. And now it can actually enrich its environment and our universe with all of its hard work. And this is how we're able to go up uh, the chain to slightly more elements now. And it's a little bit past iron, just because during this explosion, we can go slightly past. Um, but the key point is that the death of these stars is what is enriching our universe with these elements. And I think an astute uh, viewer would notice that this is not quite the full table. And we'll get back to why that is and why some of this is missing. Instead though, let's keep talking about supernovae because now we understand why they're so important to us. And really my job is um, I'm an observer. And so I, well, back in the day, I would go to telescopes. We would stay up all night. Um, I observed a lot in Chile. And one of the fun things is you, you it takes roughly 24 hours to get there. Um, where a big part of that journey is not the plane flight, but it's it's going to this small town called La Serena, and you uh, get in a little van, you drive up a mountain, and then you you stay at an astronomer hotel basically, which is next to the telescope, and you um, you work all night observing, and you sleep all day, and it's very fun because they they have um, a cafeteria where they serve you your night lunches. Um, they stock you full of cookies and coffee. It's, it's a really unique and fun experience. But all this is to say that my job is to conduct the observational experiments to look at these supernovae actually happen in action. And I told you, they evolve on short time scales. So we need to kind of be on the ball. When we see something new happen, we have to point our telescopes and get the data that we think we need to understand the underlying physics. And this is actually how that happens. Um, we have telescopes that look at the same part of the sky every few nights. And what we do is we take an older image, compare it to a newer image, and we see this nice uh, new point in the sky that must be a supernova. And what's nice is that the universe actually gives us these arrows every time. So it's really easy to find them. Um, not really, obviously. But this is really how we do it. We use computer algorithms to look at these new points in the night sky. And my job is to then translate that into physics. Uh, and the way that I do this is I go from these nice, beautiful images. And within, within that image, what's actually happening is that the supernova is giving us a whole array of photons 
and each of them have a different wavelength or color that they represent. Um, and so this is showing if I take this image and I actually break down these photons that I'm looking at into the different colors, this is what they would look like as a function of time. And this is called a spectral energy distribution or a spectrum. Um, where to be clear, a spectrum is one snapshot in time. And what's useful about this is that you see how it's kind of, um, it has all these little wiggles involved. Those are actually the fingerprints of the different elements that have been created within the supernova, or sorry, within the star over its life, and then um, kind of spread out in the supernova or created in the supernova itself. And so what we do is we take an inventory of these fingerprints and we're able to ask questions like, okay, it's a whodunit episode. What type of star exploded? What did it make in this explosion? How did it live its life? And really importantly, what is the underlying physics? So in a way, a spectrum has always been our classical method of um, classifying the underlying physics. Um, it turns out that unfortunately, I see something in chat and I don't know if I am meant to look at it. Maybe Miguel can guide oh, me. No, no, you, you go ahead. I'll keep okay. the, an eye on the chat for the questions later. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I was saying is as much as I would love if we could get a beautiful GIF like this, where we have a kind of a history of what every single photon at every single wavelength at every point in time is doing, that's unfortunately very expensive. It just turns out that to collect that many photons um, in all these different colors, you kind of have to look at it for a long time with a special instrument called a spectrograph. And believe it or not, other astronomers also have to do science on those telescopes. And so we don't have infinite time to look at every supernova. So we, we do the best we can. And instead, we use really large buckets um, or a way of, a different way of saying this is, is broad filters on uh, photometric cameras. So it's, it's similar to literally the cameras we have um, on our own phones, but clearly on much bigger telescopes. Um, and what we do is we say, well, what are the blue photons doing as a function of time versus the red photons? And if we make a plot of that, what are the, futon, the blue photons doing as a function of time? We get something like this, it, and that's what we call a light curve. It's not nearly as good as having a full spectrum, but our job is to use this light curve um, and using special statistics and machine learning, trying to still get that best guess of what the underlying physics is. So it's like the cheaper version of doing this science. But we're still, we're pretty good at it. Um, and with all of these clues, we have built a pretty comical zoo of different underlying phenomena that we use to describe all of the explosions we see in the cosmos. And in particular, we use those fingerprints I was talking about. So for example, the fingerprints of hydrogen to classify these into the different underlying physics. So maybe it's something like um, what we had been talking about, which I, I didn't specify, but it's a special type of supernova called a core collapse, which is when we, we have unfortunately run out of energy and we collapse in on ourselves. But it could also be something like um, a type 1a supernova, which we use for cosmology to measure how quickly our universe is expanding. Uh, and in this case, we, uh, we see special, different special signatures of elements to tell us that um, instead of a big star kind of exploding, some, some denser version of a star, which we'll, we'll actually hint to as a stellar corpse has decided to die its final death. Or it can be something really exotic. Um, and this is just a, a cartoon of a fairly new type of super we know about, which is called a, a super luminous supernova. We're not very clever in how we name these things, but the underlying physics is, really, I think more exciting than the name lets on. We think these are formed by um, newly formed, really dense stars that are spinning and they provide this extra oomph to the supernova that we see. Unfortunately, the universe does not provide this physics equally. With this diversity, 
comes uh, different fractions of the physics that we see. The majority of them will be um, something that I'm personally not as interested in, the ones that are really useful for cosmology, type 1a supernovae, which all kind of look the same, um, funnily enough. But within subclasses, we can go deeper and deeper and probe more and more rare and interesting and unique combinations of um, astrophysics and physics to, to really understand the most extreme scenarios that our universe can set up. And it's really within these extreme scenarios that we have a unique capability of testing some high energy physics that we, we just absolutely can't reproduce here on Earth. And that's what I'm really excited about, is understanding these much more rare classes. We're kind of going to take an extreme turn, I will warn you, to go into a fun example of um, a really rare type of event that's not actually a supernova. It's a little bit different. And we, again, not very cleverly call it a kilonova. Um, We'll talk about the origin. I want to tell you just a tiny bit about the name. It's again, not clever. It's kind of funny how bad we are at naming things. We call it kilonova because it's about uh, a thousand times brighter than a normal nova, which is just uh, an eruption of a star. But these are very distinct from supernovae. Rather than the collapse of a star, it is the merger of two really special types of stars. And I'm going to play this video that does have sound. Again, this is a simulation. It gets kind of loud. And we'll talk about it after. Very fun. Good. So let me tell you a bit about what this is. This is showing you a lovely graphic of the merger of two neutron stars. So these are two really dense stars we'll talk about. And when they merge, they produce this wonderful explosion that we can actually see with our telescopes. And there's a number of interesting phenomenon that we'll go through. First, let me just be clear. Um, Back to the same slide on the life cycle of a star. After we go supernova, I don't actually just blow off everything. I kind of hinted at this, that the star collapsed, but it didn't go, it didn't fully collapse and disappear. It bounced off of something. It turns out that we hit, when we get so dense in our collapse, we hit a special um, point, a special density. That's actually called a quantum degeneracy pressure, where basically the particles really don't want to be any closer to each other. And so to, in that sense, they have a pressure that resists the final collapse. So one of the fates that a supernova can leave behind after all this uh, extra stuff has been blown off is something called a neutron star. It's an incredibly dense star that is made up basically entirely of neutrons that are left over that are being supported by this quantum pressure. And here I'm showing you um, a silly little graphic I made on my Google Maps, um, but just showing you the actual radius of a neutron star centered on State College. They're incredibly tiny, and yet they're as massive of about half a million times the mass of Earth, or about the mass of a sun, of our sun, sorry. Um, so these things are incredibly dense. And when two of them happen to be in a, a pair and they eventually collide, this is where really unique physics happens that we're excited about. Um, in particular, I want to tell you, why, why do we care about the light, which is what I'm interested in, because I, I am an observer who wants to go observe these things. Well, this is why. Neutron star mergers and particularly the light counterpart, which we call a kilonova, um, is responsible for producing essentially every other element to fill out this periodic table. Um, uh, 
And so, and so really understanding this merger and the light counterpart is telling us about the very heaviest elements in our universe, things like gold and platinum and where they're coming from. Um, this slide is, I'm gonna say like my most technical maybe, it's, it's kind of confusing, but I just briefly wanna explain why it is that supernovae, um, why it is, sorry, neutron star merger kilonovae can get to such heavy elements. And uh, the reason why is because, so what essentially is happening is that the, um, so the element is the way it gains mass or so it becomes a heavier element is that it, it eats up neutrons. But then unfortunately, when you eat up neutrons, so when you go this way, um, you get really unstable. You don't like to be in that kind of configuration where I have an atom with neutrons and protons, and now I'm suddenly eating too many neutrons. Um, and so what happens is something called beta decay. I lose an electron and I make it a proton, and then I reach a more stable configuration. So I eat some neutrons, I fall back when I uh, lose an electron and I, I, have, um, I gain a proton in that sense. Um, and then I'm in a more stable configuration. And then maybe another neutron will hit me. I'll be like, oh, okay, that's fine, but I'm gonna fall back again. So in normal supernovae, uh, this is kind of what happens. I have iron-like elements and it'll, it'll go up a little bit up the chain. The only way I can avoid falling back is if I could eat a ton of neutrons at once and then uh, lose an electron. Then I would go way up the periodic table and fall back one or two spots. So I need some type of process that lets me eat lots of neutrons really quickly. Um, and this is called a rapid neutron capture process or R process that we think uh, uniquely happens in kilonovae with, you could see probably a small exception of an alternative um, place where this might happen. And this happens because we have two neutron stars. So we have a very neutron rich environment. Um, and, so, and so what the way I like to kind of phrase this is because of we need these neutrons, neutron star mergers in many ways is the only way that the universe can make things like gold and platinum. So if you have a gold ring on your finger, um, I hope you're pleased to know that this came from a merger of two incredibly weird stars, uh, probably millions or billions years ago in the cosmos. And another reason why these mergers are so interesting, in addition to just um, where the elements are coming from, is that first part of the video we watched where they spent a long time, the neutron stars spent a long time dancing around one another. And it turns out that these stars are so dense that they actually drag space time itself a little bit with them. And what happens is that space time will have uh, ripples that we can actually detect here on earth, which is wild to me. Uh, and detection of these ripples is not directly my science, but Penn State is a leader on this front. In particular, um, we have a huge role in the gravitational wave detector called LIGO uh, here in America. So we have two sites, one in Louisiana, one in Washington. Um, and essentially these are like giant seismometers. They're, they're looking for wiggles in the earth that aren't from an earthquake or something, uh, or in some cases, um, actually in Louisiana, it's near LSU. And apparently I hear that they have uh, a lot of detections when there's a football game and they actually have to turn off the instrument. Um, but anyways, so it's not detections though from earth, it is detections from space-time itself that are causing these little ripples that cause these two little arms to very slightly change. Um, and I, I'm not gonna discuss that physics in detail, but it is fascinating. And Penn State plays a massive role. In particular, we do, um, in addition to just a lot of science, we host a lot of the computational needs of LIGO. So really analyzing this data. And we do this on um, our really wonderful supercomputer, which is called ROAR. Um, which does not stand for anything. It's just an exciting name. Uh, and I think one thing that's really fun about this is it's such an active field that's happening and evolving right now. And Penn State has just uh, increased our leadership by becoming one of the members of this brand new NSF funded, um, very large collaboration, the Nuclear Physics for Multi-Messenger Mergers, so NP3M. Um, so this is, this is such a fun field. 
And this is why um, we really care about these events is because they're multi messengers in the sense of we get a lot of information from the light that we see, but we get a lot of information from the noise that we hear from the gravitational waves themselves. And I, I just want to quickly play this video. It's a little hard to hear, but this is actually, if you were to convert the data that LIGO hears or detects with its seismometer, basically, um, then and then convert it to sound, this is what we would hear when two neutron stars merge into each other. And I started pretty late. Um, and you'll mainly just hear kind of static noise, but near the end, you'll hear a little whoop noise. And that is actually the merger. So let's listen. Oh, it's muted. Ha! All right, let's go back. I don't know if you heard that, so let's play it one more time. So you can just slightly hear the whoop noise um, from the merger. Actually, I don't know why, but it, we, it, it, we can't hear. It starts with the noise, but then it disappears. <laughs> oh, that's funny. OK, <laughs> no worries. You'll have to believe me then. It's a little bit of a whoop noise. Thank you. Um, I want to re-highlight the fact that neutron star mergers, although there's a number of really fun scientific avenues and they're really exciting, they're just so incredibly rare to find um, in terms of pointing our telescopes to the sky. And there's a few reasons why that we won't go into, but to really highlight this point, the first time we ever really for sure definitely saw a kilonova, one that was associated with a LIGO gravitational wave detection, was in 2017. And that has since been the only one that we have both um, heard in gravitational waves and seen with our telescopes. So it's incredibly hard to find these things. In a sense, it's like we're digging through this haystack of cosmic phenomenon to find the rarest needles that offer the most unique perspectives on astrophysics. And I want to dive more into this because this is really where the machine learning aspect comes in, which is a large part of my research, is thinking about methodologies to search for these types of events, the rare phenomena. Let me give some context. I think it's a little bit surprising. Um, so supernovae are more common than you might think. Uh, we discover about 10,000 of them every single year um, in most recent years. So I will say though, that number has been growing exponentially um, for about the past few decades. And so this is a, a bar plot, a, so it's a histogram as a function of time, the number of supernovae we've detected where this is a logarithmic scale. So in the 80s, we only found about 10 supernovae per year, which is very respectable. That's great. Um, but thanks to new missions that have been coming online, and here I'm just naming some of them, whose key goal has been looking at larger and larger patches of the sky every few nights um, to deeper and deeper limits. So we're looking for really dim things. That's what's really been driving this exponential growth. Um, so now, you know, we're discovering about 10,000 every single year. However, I mentioned that the best way for us to classify or to get a first guess at what the underlying physics is, is to get um, a spectrum, at least at one point in time. And like I said, it is very expensive. So we only classify about 10% of what we actually find. And to be totally honest, um, that 90% does not largely get used in scientific work. So it's really, and, and the reason for that is because we don't always know what the underlying physics is. So it's a challenge to choose the ones that we care about um, and then to act upon that quickly so that we can get interesting different perspectives, so multi-wavelength follow-up to really dive into what the physics is. So maybe this sounds like a little bit of a problem, but it's about to get, in, it's going to have to be a, a very big problem um, for a very exciting reason. 
a new observatory is coming online in early 2024. Uh, the deadlines are a little pushed back due to COVID um, from 2023. And that's called the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, this is a fairly recent picture. This was from 2021 of the Vera Rubin Observatory actively being built in Chile. Um, and it's this wonderful partnership between Chile and the United States with some international um, uh, data access partnerships where we're really building this wonderful new large, so eight meter class telescope that's going to be a discovery machine for supernovae. And we will dive into that. First, I want to highlight the name. Um, so Vera Rubin is, of course, a wonderful scientist famous for uh, discovering dark matter. So this, this unseen matter that seems to exist in most of our galaxies, that's how it was discovered. Um, and who, um, I, I just want to say, is also an incredible, not just scientist, but human, a true advocate for uh, the diversity within sciences, um, and who, who's really a, a great role model for what a true scientist should be. So I'm really excited that, that we were honoring her in this way with this wonderful observatory that's going to change the field. And let me tell you how it will change the field. Um, this is that same bar chart. Note that now it's not logarithmic, but here's what's going to happen when the Vera Rubin Observatory comes online. Our discovery rate is not even going to skyrocket. I don't even know if that's a, the way to describe it. It's breaking exponential growth. It's ridiculously massive change for our field. We will go from discovering 10,000 supernovae every year to a million supernovae every single year. So that's, I think about uh, 2,500 every night. And with that change, um, we don't necessarily expect a lot more spectroscopic information to be available. So we're not gonna get too many more spectra. Imagine it's roughly flat. So then the fraction of supernovae, which now get a classification is 0.1%. So we're really at a crossroads of, are we really gonna throw away 99.9% of the science we could be doing? No, uh, no, we will not. We, we just need to think of new methodologies to figure out how we can best um, classify and then understand these various supernovae. And in particular, like I said, I actually care about the rarest phenomenon. I care about astrophysics that, we, we, that really probes um, high energy physics that we cannot reproduce on Earth, the most interesting kind of initial conditions for these explosions. So I wanna point out that even with our most rare classes, which I think I personally would say is something, maybe this isn't exactly true based on this diagram, but superluminous supernovae, as I pointed out earlier, are kind of one of the newest players on the block. Um, and it's one of the most rare classes. We have in total seen maybe about a hundred of them. Um, and that doesn't mean well studied. That means we've discovered maybe a hundred of these things. Um, and we will discover about a hundred, or sorry, 10,000 of them every year with the Vera Rubin Observatory. So we need to start thinking even deeper about the astrophysics that we're looking for. And I don't think it's ridiculous by any means to expect the unexpected, to be looking for the unknown unknowns. What if we see something totally new and we don't even know what we're looking for? So that's what I use machine learning to do. I look for needles in the haystack in a very special way. In particular, this is the way I like to describe it. Um, as I said, we can't take spectra, they're too expensive. Instead, we have to make light curves, which is the light of the photons in different colors, green versus red, as a function of time. And the light curves, different types of underlying astrophysics lead to different types of light curves. It's not as clear cut as getting a spectrum, but it's still an okay amount of information. We have this weird problem though, where, okay, I want to be able to both classify all the supernova I find into all these various categories and, I want something that's able to say, oh my goodness, 
I don't even know what this is. This is brand new. And that's a tough problem. Normally how we would maybe do this um, is I would use physics to build a model where I could say, here's what my data looks like. What type of physics can I use? So kind of twisting knobs on things like how much energy was in this explosion? How much uh, new nucleosynthetic material did I make? And I would kind of pull apart my model in different directions until it best matched the data I would have. And then I would be able to describe my model with just a few numbers, um, like, ah, yes, I think this is a, a core collapse supernova with this mass was ejected from it. Um, but if I'm looking for new physics, I can't do that by definition. I can't write down my physical model. So I'm going to try to do something clever and use a special type of machine learning to do that part for me, which sounds a little odd, but let me just show you very loosely what I'm talking about. Um, in particular, we use a special model, a class of models called a neural network to figure out those model parameters for us. And the model parameters are not associated with physics. They're just associated with, hey, these are all the different types of shapes and variations I expect. Can you figure out a few numbers to help me describe these data that I see? And the way this works is, is kind of silly. So neural networks, um, they're really not so hard to understand, although we won't go in detail. You can think of them as just something that's really good at approximating um, an arbitrary shape of a, a function like this. And it does that by um, using what's called linear algebra or matrices. So if you've taken like algebra two, I think you've seen these, where we, we just really multiply a bunch of matrices together with a little bit of tweaking um, in order to ask a special type of neural network to, hey, given this data I've seen, I just want you to exactly reproduce the data for me. And maybe that sounds a little silly because if I just looked at my data and I copy and paste it over here, well, I've exactly reproduced it, but I haven't learned any model parameters from that. And so the clever thing about this neural network is that my matrices uh, squeeze the information into smaller and smaller amounts of numbers. That's called an encoder. And then, okay, I'll give it the freedom to now kind of uh, loosen up that and you can decode it back into the light curve. But all of the information that describes this light curve should be squished down into just a few model parameters. Not a physical model, it's just a model that has been learned from looking at lots of examples of what supernovae in general look like. There's of course some bells and whistles to this um, that I'm not going to go into, but I just want to say that we use really special types of neural networks, um, in particular ones that are just like on your phone when um, you're texting someone and it's guessing what you want to say next. We use a very similar concept to continuously guess at what we think these model parameters are. And that translates into what we think the physics is. So you can think of taking that, that little box of the different parameters, making a, a picture and putting all the type 1As that I know about, maybe they would all live here. And then the neural network would learn that, oh, kilonovae look really different than type 1As. So I'm going to put them all over here. And so we use this framework to classify the supernova light curves without having to get a spectrum. And what's so nice about this model is that it doesn't know about physics. I haven't told it anything about the physics. I just showed it data. And so because of that, it is sensitive potentially to new physics. And this is called anomaly detection within uh, machine learning. And we use this to help us find, hopefully, the unknown unknowns. And this really is the ultimate goal, one of my ultimate goals um, with the upcoming Vera Rubin Observatory. It's to discover unique and new astrophysics, the one in one million circumstance that happens in our cosmos that we will finally be able to at least have probabilistically the chance of seeing and understanding. And with these machine learning techniques, our goal really is to, is to not just pick them out um, from the haystack after the fact, 
It's to do it in real time in a week after first detecting it with our telescope to understand, oh my gosh, this looks completely different than what we've seen before. I need to get a multi-wavelength follow-up and really understand what these photons are up to. And then connecting that full story of new physics. I wanna end on a slightly different note. Um, so the theme of this series for at least a semester has really been about connecting AI applications to society. And I wanna be clear that um, I, you should be so careful about um, making claims that what we do in an astrophysical context is any way similar to what um, people who are doing uh, terrestrial or more human studies, soci sociological studies with techniques like machine learning. However, I do wanna point out that at the fundamental mathematical level, level, we are implementing very similar techniques and learning from one another. In particular, I've emphasized the fact that my science requires algorithms that do not just understand the majority. If I did that, I would just call everything a type 1A. I would be right 70% of the time. That's a C, it's pretty good and I could move on, but clearly I would have failed in my objective. And so what I do is look at uh, special machine learning techniques to really dive into understanding diversity that we see and understanding um, the minority classes. And to be clear, this is something that has been an issue um, within machine learning in a more human context. And I, I generally think that's a failure. These algorithms exist, they're implemented within multiple domains, um, and it's, it's honestly, it's easy to do. Um, I also wanna say though, that because there is significant overlap in the mathematics that what we're doing in astronomy and what other people doing, are doing in social sciences, um, I, as astronomers, we are actually always aware that algorithms we develop, like anomaly detection, can have broad ethical implications. And it's, it's worthwhile to point out that even though we're studying phenomenon that's light years away, it will always connect back to our understandings of each other here on Earth. And that's, it's important to always keep that in mind in doing this type of research. So this is the end. Um, I want to end with a really wonderful quote by Vera Rubin, who again, I said, is just a wonderful scientist all around. Um, this is a little corny, but uh, one of the things I appreciated as a young college student was one of her addresses she gave um, to a graduating Berkeley class. And this is a quote from this, um, which is that each of us can change the world. We are made of star stuff and we are connected to the universe. And I think this is true and it continues to be true in the science that we explore and its connections um, to people here. So thank you so much for your time. I'm very happy to answer any questions on all levels. Thanks. Virtual class. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ashley. Well, I get the, I get the <laughs> privilege of, of being able to clap myself. So. Uh, please uh, start uh, posting your questions uh, in the question and answer uh, tab. I, I see the questions here. And so I, I, I'll move to the questions, uh, but one quick comment, I, you know, super interesting, of course, thank you. But uh, you were saying that the search of the unknown unknowns was like the, the needle in the haystack. Well, not really, because that there you know that you're looking for a needle. Yours is worse. You, you're looking in the haystack, <laughs> but you fair. don't know what you're looking for, really. Yeah. It's not a needle. You don't know if it <laughs> looks like a needle. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking through a haystack. <laughs> it's like, it's like the, the uh, garage, door, no, storage wars, but and you don't know what's in there, and you don't know what you're going to find. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> So I have a question uh, from Zachary. Uh, how well does the neural network classifier handle non-regular cadence observations as input? 
Oh, I love that question. Okay. So I, um, I very much skimmed over the mathematics of what's happening, um, but it's actually pretty interesting. So this isn't something I mentioned, but telescopes don't look at the same point in the sky every night in the same um, colors. So they don't look at the red photons every night. And so mathematically, this can make it really challenging because we have um, unevenly sampled, is the word we say, light curves um, that have multiple colors to them. We call it multivariate. So there are multiple variables happening. This is a pretty unique data set. I actually mostly compare this to um, patient data. So it's like if you go in and you get one type of blood test every other week, but then sometimes they'll send your blood results to do a different test and they, they can't do every test every week. Um, and so we use really special techniques and particular something called Gaussian processes. It's just a statistical technique um, and specially designed uh, neural nets. So they're specifically called recurrent uh, neuron type neural nets to help us deal with this pretty major effect. Um, so, so we do pretty well by accounting for it very cleverly within the algorithm design. I hope that answers the question. So um, for people raising hands, I, I, we don't have the option to open your mic. So please uh, type your questions in the question and answer tab or in the chat, I, I can do both. So the next question is, uh, you said obtaining spectra is very expensive. So is there an uh, artificial intelligence option to create a less expensive option to obtain spectra? Oh, I love this idea. So first, let me just quickly say why that's expensive. Um, and it's kind of easy to understand. It's essentially like I'm putting different sized buckets outside to collect rain, but I need enough raindrops to measure. I guess this doesn't quite make sense. I would just need special buckets that collect raindrops of a certain size versus a different size. And the issue is that I need to collect enough photons so that I can statistically understand um, the very the random variations. And so that's why spectra is so expensive is because we put out lots of tiny buckets versus a big bucket that can just take a ton of them at once. Um, and I feel like in my <laughs> explanation, I've forgotten the question. Oh, can we do a machine learning algorithm? Yeah. So I love this question. And the answer is actually yes, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, given enough examples of those light curves I showed you, so just the color variations over, it's not so important, the color variations over time, um, we can actually go backwards with enough of them. It's very hard because we have a signal within our data that's not too strong, but if you know the physics, you can back out the spectra and people are working on that. Um, I think it's very, very cool. So then Satya is asking, um, he, he says first, uh, really glad to hear your thoughts about connection to social issues. Um, what does it take to increase the fraction of transients you are able to classify? Better understanding of the physics of supernovae, better algorithms, uh, superior computational infrastructure, or all of the above. Yeah, so nowadays, um, we do a lot of classifications with those light curves that I showed you. Although I will say those typically light, sorry, typically supernovae classified with their light curves alone, so no spectra. It's true, they do not actually make it through the full scientific process for the most part. We don't do studies on them. And I really hope that part changes. Um, for the rarest classes, which is really our weak point right now, classifying that physics, we just need more events. And the issue really is diversity. We don't understand the full diversity of the rare phenomenon. And so it's hard for us to simulate that diversity and show it to a neural network. <clears throat> so the neural network I've designed is good at picking those out as weird, but ideally we would like to, what Miguel said, we would like to identify them as needles we know about and then train our classifiers to say, oh yeah, it's this type that I already know about. And, and that's the struggle right now. Um, so it's not quite computational. It's more, we're actually data limited in this case. I see. So then there's a, a, a comment and a question from Abai. Uh, great talk, Ashley. On the last point on relation to social issues, yeah. is there already a dialogue between the type of algorithms that you use and Google, Facebook, et cetera, use to improve on biases by going beyond conclusions that refer only to majority? 
Yeah. So I will say, um, I guess two things there is, I think that's what's so, this is, it's kind of shameful. These are, um, techniques that are not new to better understand. And I don't want to dive into mathematics, but it's really not so complicated to understand, um, the full diversity of your training set. And I think it's actually a failure to just look at the mean or the median, uh, the majority class of your data set. So there is an open dialogue. There's a literature on how to do this. Um, but then I also want to say that there is also an ongoing literature of the ethical implications for everyone um, as an increasing part of, so I publish in astronomy, but I also publish in machine learning, um, not journals, but their, their conferences, the equivalent doesn't quite matter. Um, but as part of those publications in machine learning, we actually do very regularly now write um, a short statement on what are the ethical implications of the algorithm you're presenting? Um, which I think is it's helpful just at least to have to reflect on that fact. Um, yeah. So there's a quick comment. Do you have any suggestions for how astronomers can name things better? <laughs> in, uh, in like for for things like Google being unable to identify. No, no, no. You mentioned you, you mentioned that. The misnomers of kilonova or supernova and that oh oh like this it's um, not my question but i i, I thought I, that maybe that's what yeah, he's asking so so like the naming i'm so sorry the naming yes. conventions yes yeah okay so um i <laughs> there's so many thoughts i'm not sure <laughs> i think this, so this is a very observational thing it's like there's two different worlds there's the theorists who don't look at telescopes and it's the observers who like only can think in terms of things we see, which is how we get these silly names like super luminous. But then the, the theoretical perspective, we would say something like a magnetar driven supernova, which in some ways may be a lot more easy to sell to general audiences. It sounds really cool. Um, so yeah, I don't quite know. I'm not sure why we have such silly names for things. Yeah, so this is, I, I don't know if this is, uh, you your expertise, but uh, the, the other question is uh, how will astrophysicists use NASA's uh, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope to understand dark matter and dark energy? Yeah, so I am. Um, so in some ways, it's not exactly my expertise because I specifically don't study what's called type 1a cosmology. So that's using type 1a supernovae, which I call boring, kind of horribly, um, as standard candles to measure distances. I will say that the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is going to be excellent at doing this. It will be very exciting. Um, and in particular, it's because it, it's going to find many of them very far away, essentially. And so we can better ground our understanding of how the expansion of the universe is changing over time. I will say for my science, one thing that I'm excited about is looking at the, the very first stars. So the ones that actually don't go through this whole process, that onion shape of nucleosynthesis I explained, but they undergo um, very unique nucleosynthesis because they're not working with much. And those are called um, parent stability or pulsational parent stability or population three supernovae. So the very first ones in our universe. And that, that's what I'm really excited about with the uh, Roman telescope. Thank you. So please type your questions if you have more questions for Ashley. I'll give you my usual seven seconds. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys understand? No questions? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, Ashley. Yeah, this thank you. Great talk. Uh, before uh, you, you guys leave, remember that when you are leaving the webinar, you will either get a post survey immediately in Zoom or in your email within a day or so. So please take a minute to fill this out and help us determine uh, how to improve our future lectures and to make them more engaging, um, popular. Thank you so much. Next week uh, webinar will be at the same time, same link. Uh, the topic will be using artificial intelligence to improve patient provider communication. And it will be presented by the Simplify team 
which is a, a Penn State College of Medicine group. Thank you all very much. Thank you again, Ashley. And I'll see you again next week. Bye. Thank you.